Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations with artists, writers, and curators. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 50. Today's guest is Alexander Chi. So, hey, folks, how are you doing today? I, I don't know when you're listening to this, but if it's still 2017, odds are that something kind of awful has happened recently, or maybe is even happening right now. Uh, you know, sometimes the news gets a little overwhelming, and while I don't necessarily advocate disengaging, I do think that it's good to spend some time thinking about stuff that makes you happy, you know, stuff that's good, stuff that matters to you. So in that spirit, here's something that mattered to me recently. If you follow literary news, then you know that last week, um, that's last week as I'm recording this, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And you know what? I'm really happy about that. Uh, now, I have to admit right off the bat that I haven't read all of Ishiguro's books. He's written seven novels, I think, and I've read two of them. But wow, I loved those books. Um, I read Never Let Me Go in 2005 and The Buried Giant last year, 2016. And honestly, you know, the first thing that struck me about each of them is how very, very British they are. That's that's how they feel to me, is very British. And so here's a man with a very Japanese name writing very British stories. You can understand why that would pique my interest, right? And then back in 05, you know, I hadn't ever read anything by him before, and I hadn't read any reviews about his work. But thinking about this story and thinking about the name, I thought, you know, I bet you a lot of people are probably confused or maybe even shocked by that combination. And of course, that's true. Um, I think that it says a lot, you know, that so many people can look at a man who has spent nearly his entire life and certainly all of his formative years in Britain. And then because of his name or his face, they're surprised that he chooses to write British stories. And I think that the fact that that he does it anyway, that he insists on being able to write the stories that matter to him and not be put in a box, I think that's kind of a revolutionary act. But, you know, none of that would matter if he were a mediocre writer or even if he were merely good. But nobody writes like Ishiguro. And the fact that he was honored with the Nobel Prize makes me feel hopeful, if that makes sense. Um, I could probably keep talking about this, but I, I want to give the last word on this to a friend of mine. His name's Kenny Koble. And he's probably the biggest Ishiguro fan I know. Uh, the day of the announcement, he posted this long Twitter thread about what it all meant to him. And it's just wonderful. So I put a link in the show notes. Go read it when you get a chance. All right. So as I mentioned, today's guest is Alexander Chi. Alexander is the author of the novels Edinburgh and The Queen of the Night. He is a contributing editor at The New Republic, an editor-at-large at VQR, a critic-at-large at The Los Angeles Times, and an associate professor of English at Dartmouth College. And forthcoming in April of 2018, he will be releasing a new collection of essays entitled How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, the title essay of which was originally published on BuzzFeed and which I've linked in the show notes. Now, I read Alexander's novel, the Queen of the Night last year, and it was one of my favorite books of the year. I was really pleased to get to talk with him about it. And then that led me to sort of discover, seek out some of his uh, essays, which are equally fantastic. He always writes in his nonfiction with such amazing nuance and sensitivity. He never goes for the simple take. He always goes for the full complexity of anything that he's writing about. It's just wonderful. Um, Anyway, so I liked uh, The Queen of the Night so much, I decided that I'm going to do another giveaway. So if you'd like to win a copy of Alexander's book, The Queen of the Night, uh, just stick around until the end of the show, and I'll give you all the details on how you can do that. All right, so let's jump in, shall we? If you are on Twitter, you can use the hashtag ChannelOpenPod to join in the conversation. And now, here's my conversation with Alexander Chi. So your essay collection, which you mentioned, um, has, so this has the same title as a, an essay that you wrote, I think last, or a year before last, how to write an autobiographical novel. Yes. 
Yeah, I was just rereading that this morning before we talked because I think that was one of the first essays of yours that I'd read um, when I read it, and um, and as so as someone who you know I make photographic work that's very autobiographical, and as a writer, I often also am very pulled in that direction. So when I read that essay um, the first time and today, actually, just there was something about it that really just grabbed onto me. You know, it really, I, I kind of felt like, oh, yes, but also, oh, no, um, when I was reading it. Um, and so... <laughs> But you mean like you were arguing with it in your head or No, it was kind of like like when I was reading it I felt like, "Oh, oh, this is great. Like this is such a good essay and and I'm I'm like this is I, there was something that about the you know what you were describing in it, the str- sort of struggle and the costs of of making autobiographical work felt very resonant. And anytime I I I see anything um, any piece of, of art or literature or whatever that, that feels, that describes something that I find familiar, I, I feel this, this real sort of almost elation, you know, but then, at, so that was my first reaction, but then as I was thinking more about, you know, it sort of set in the, the costs that you were describing to, to doing this kind of work, and I was like, oh yeah, oh that's true, oh, oh no, oh what, what am I gonna, what am I doing? So, um, yeah, it's something on my mind a lot. Um, you know, as I, I make work about my family or about myself, um, about my kids or about my family of origin, my hometown, um, what is it, what does it, what do I get out of making this work? But also what does it cost me and what will it cost me in the future? Um, and that was, that essay was, you know, a lot of it was about that really, really sort of struck those, those notes, those anxieties for me a little bit. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I think, um, you know, I mean, or rather I'm glad that it struck a chord for you. I, it calls to mind this, um, this review that Joan Gideon got, uh, by Caitlin Flanagan in the Atlanta in 2011 mm. um, that really hammered home to me sort of the, the problems of uh, of putting yourself out there like that in the way like that Joan Didion certainly has you know for for decades you know and she's she's an interesting figure in part because she's she's lived long enough to have this uh, almost she's almost like a cultural multi tool for people who want to talk about different things where like she can be you know like the paragon of of reporting um, even though she really actually didn't like reporting that much um, uh, or she can be everything that's wrong with personal essays by, by women, or she can be, you know, she can be all these different things because she has been all these different things, you know? And the, the weird thing to me is, is how like people really like to try to make her into someone that she actually was anxious to leave behind that young woman, you know, leaning against the Corvette confidently smoking a cigarette. Um, she she worked very hard to write herself away from that image after first cultivating it very carefully. You know, um, uh, and most people still, you know, when they like to mock her, they bring up that. Um, I think it uh, was it Pauline Kale. No, oh, was it Renata Adler? Someone wrote this, like, very... Oh, no, it was Barbara Ehrenreich, I think, who wrote this very damning review of Didion. It, but it was still... That that review came pretty early in her career comparatively to, like, how old she is now, you know? So all, all this has happened. This is the kind of context for this review that I saw in 2011, which 
you know, it, was, it basically was like Joan Didion got old. Um, and it's like, yeah, that was always going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, she was, well, she's human. She was always going to get old. But it was, it was this, it was this piece that kind of posed as a review of, um, her, her newest book. It was the, the one that she had published after the year of magical thinking about her, um, you know, crawling down the review right now. It actually takes a while to get to what the review is about. Um, and there was this, part of the review where she described Joan Didion coming to dinner at her home when her father was the English professor at Berkeley and Joan had been invited to give a reading. And she described like her mother's this case uh, for Joan arriving in a Chanel suit and kind of makes fun of her for it. You know, this section, I have it open on my phone now. She never took her purse off her lap, my mother said afterwards. Of that night, got back. She took it to the dinner table. Um, if you had told my mother that Joan Didion regularly served elaborately cooked meals to 50 people at a time on Spo China in a rambling and very Berkeley house in the seedy part of Hollywood, that interviewed Jim Di- Morrison and entertained Janis Joplin, she would have been shocked. Didion seemed like a young woman who had never been to a dinner party without her parents. She seemed like someone who had one good thing to wear and would bravely wear it whenever an engagement even hinted at formality. I can tell you this for certain, anything you have ever read by Didion about the shyness that played her in her youth and about her inarticulousness in those days in the face of even the most banal questions is not a writer's exaggeration of a minor character trait for literary effect. Contemporary diagnosis for the young woman at her dinner table would have been profound, crippling social anxiety disorder. Mm. So it's this kind of, she hauls it out as a kind of damning uh, anecdote and I just remember thinking, like, I mean, I, I have, I can't even think of how many times I have been to dinner at some faculty member's home or uh, at a restaurant or what have you and met some kid. And the idea that, like, 30 years later, I would have to face them writing a review about what a dick I was. <laughs> Because of what I wore or how I handled myself that night. But like presented as a kind of like way of approaching my written work, like I just was like, literally, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, and, and it's this, uh, this way in which I think when you put yourself out there like that and put yourself in your work the way that she has, because she's, she's written, fiction that's autobiographical, she's written um, essays, both, you know, you you end up in this realm where people review you instead of the work, mm. you know, and, uh, and that's, I don't know, that seems like carelessness, but at the same time, it's also like, there's this, there's this contract also that American culture has with its writers where they want us to they want us to use our personality to sell things. Now probably more than ever. You know? Um, Janet Malcolm's Two Lives, for, for example, is uh, a fascinating look at, uh, at, the, at the decision that um, Gertrude Stein made to be famous, to be a literary celebrity. And uh, you know, it was it was like a deliberate effort on her part to to do that, and she she got it. She was like, "Oh, America needs this mm. to pay attention to you," you know, and and so she she did this kind of like very different sort of. She made herself into an icon, probably in the same way that Didion did. I mean, if you take off like the 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 apparatus of like the symbols involved. It, it's a, you know, it goes back. It goes back to Whitman. Whitman was. Um, we think of him as being like this very serious literary man, and in many ways he was. But he, at the time, he was known as also like something of a literary impresario, somebody who 
who understood how to get the public's attention by inhabiting this kind of dramatic character out in public mm. uh, for consumption. And when I think about my own decision to, to do or to not do these things, you know, I think about it uh, increasingly in the sort of context of, like, what have writers before me been asked to do? Why did they do it? What did they want? What did they get out of it? Is it worth it? You know? And that's, that was kind of where that went. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, the essay that you're talking about that I wrote, that, you know, that the Buzzfeed, the title essay of the collection, you know, I, at the time that I wrote it, I was, I was just, like, thinking about all of these different aspects of, of, of the way I approached my first novel, you know, and thinking about moments like, you know, my, my brother-in-law, for example, who's known me quite a while and is a good friend, at one point, like, actually getting mixed up about, like, what was the novel and what was my life. Hmm. And I thought, that's really interesting. <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't happened in a while, but it, it did happen. Hmm. And, uh, I, and I, it was something that I observed myself. Yeah. It's sort of, um, you know, if, if, you know, for me as a photographer, um, there's, uh, you know, if I make autobiographical work, um, you know, work from my life, it's, it's in some ways, um, in some ways it's a little more concrete how things are or are not of my life because, with a photograph, you're you're catch, capturing something in a way that doesn't seem manipulated, um, or it seems mm-hmm. it seems more captured um, in a way, so that it fe- that there's a sense of of uh, recording or documentation, and and therefore of um, truth to it, where. Mm-hmm. Fiction is fiction is more obviously slippery in that way because, you know, the the author appears to be more <clears throat> imposed as an intermediary between the event and the the reader. I think photography um, is not as it's not as straightforward as a lot of a lot of viewers take it to be, but it does strike me that that's a big difference between what you're describing and, and what I've gone through with my, like if I, you know, I have a series of photographs about my experience as a parent and my children are in it. So, you know, uh, the photographs may not necessarily be about the kids, but rather about my feelings about my kids. But I can't really escape the fact that like, yes, that is my child in this photograph. So, that's something at least that moment, like what we take away from the moment might be, might be something that I'm manipulating as the artist, but what's in with the subject of the photograph, at least is something more concrete. I I think that's just just what jumped out at me, sort of a difference between working as a photographer and working as a writer, something I try to do both of. Um, But it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. It's something with both, because I write a lot of personal essays also as, as, as you have, um, as well that, that, um, and, and the way people talk about personal essays is so can be really interesting, but also really tiresome. I feel like, you know, um, but, but, but something that I often think about is, you know, if I'm writing a personal essay, which of course is very different from writing autobiographical fiction, which is something that I was, it's been on my mind lately because it's something that I, I, I have some th- ideas to try to work through, but that with the personal essay, um, you know, you, you, the, the way that people will react to it, if they recognize the, the event or the anecdote or themselves or somebody they know it like that, there's a, there's a real weight to that. And it's not something that I necessarily thought about a lot before people started reading the things that I wrote. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
I mean, I I think there's a you know about the eye novel, the Japanese eye novel. No. Uh, it's a uh, it's a literary tradition. Um, let's see. This is from the Wikipedia entry on it. Uh, the I novel or Shusetsu or uh, Watakushi Shusetsu is a literary genre in Japanese literature used to describe a type of confessional literature where the events in the story correspond to events in the author's life. This genre was founded based on the Japanese reception of naturalism during the Meiji period. Many authors believed the form reflected greater individuality and the less constrained method of writing. From its beginning, the I novel was a genre that was also meant to expose the dark side of society or the dark side of the author's life. There are several general rules for the creation of an I novel. The first one was that it was often written from the first person perspective. This is where the I of I novel comes from. The Japanese language contains a number of different words for I generally. The form Watashi was used in the I novel. I novels attempt to portray a realistic view of the world, thus the genre type of naturalism, as autobiographical works, they involve real experiences to be completely portrayed with language. Because these two concepts were so important to the authors, they used the events of their own lives for their subject matter. Many of them were also trained in literary studies. So their works expressed a great knowledge of literature. Uh, additionally, compared to formal writing styles influenced by Chinese literature, they use more casual language. So, the writers they list here are like uh, Shisaku Endo, uh, Osama, Osamu Dezai, um, Shimazaki Toson, uh, and Tayama Katai. Um, this is like a early 19th century stuff, also. It's not like uh, it's up through the 40s and 50s. Um, uh, into the present day, um, but it's like, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's funny because we, we hear a lot about autofiction um, lately, but uh, I, like I was curious about some of the older examples of it, and I stumbled across this, I forget where, it was some, like a, some review or something that I was reading contained a reference to it, and I decided to go off and check it out. Um, and I think in the review uh, that I was reading, it was, that, it was something like, you know, everyone knows it's autobiographical, uh, and they agree not to uh, to talk about that, which I thought was interesting mm. <laughs> as a conceit. Um, it's not a, it's not something that's in the Wikipedia entry, for example. Um, but um, whether or not that piece is true, I think, you know. Uh, it's a the idea that it has a purpose, you know, that you're essentially using it to talk about the darker parts of the self and of the culture. I think is uh, is useful as a way of thinking about it. Hmm. You know, yeah. It. I don't think you know. It's. It is something that I think. Well, I think maybe readers don't necessarily think about, or or audience. Um, Sometimes, and, and, and even I find, you know, some artists themselves don't necessarily think a lot about how a piece of art functions or is intended to function. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to think about. I think it can be very clarifying, too, um, certainly for me, uh, in, in trying to make something. Um, it, it has been, having that first realization of the first time I had that realization was very motivating and and also very useful in figuring out how to how to continue and how to edit and how to um how to refine the thing that i was making so yeah that is mm. Mm. i think that you know the it's often it's often work that's accused of narcissism is the reason i found that that sort of purposeful description of it useful. It's like a, you know, I feel like we're, we're supposed to be too embarrassed to continue making work this way. Mm. <laughs> like we, you know, like we're operating in bad case. Um, yeah. Even though it's also a kind of unwritten rule that everyone expects us to teach through. Yeah. Know? So there's a sort of like, you know, 
the, the question that I, I get so often when I do readings of, of my fiction is like, how autobiographical is it? Which is a little bit like the reason for the title of the essay collection and, and for the essay. Like, you know, just this constant question of like, how much of this is invented? How much of this did you really live through? You know? And I remember with my first novel, I, I would get impatient with the question and people would ask me that and I would say, like, would you believe it more if I told you? You know? Or would you believe it? Yes, less. You know, like, which, what do you need to know in asking that question? And people would, they'd back off usually, they'd be like, oh, sorry. You know, but they would never really explain what was the fascination, like, or even whether it was a fascination, or, they, or whether they were just sort of saying it because they thought it was a thing to ask. Hmm. You know, like, a, almost a reflective thing to ask in, in face with a novelist. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it's such a weird thing because the um, because I mean, really, I, I mean, I think I, I understand that is something that that people can get very obsessed about, and I, even I've I've had that question about about art before, about like you know, I remember having I, I actually wrote a, uh, a a blog post once about about uh, Jenny Lewis album and <clears throat> wondering you know, how much of it is real. But even in, you know, as I was writing it, I was sort of realizing this, like, it doesn't really matter because the truth of the piece of the work is not, is not really related to the fact of the piece. Um, that, that it, that the emotional resonance or, or what it reveals, uh, about myself, um, as I listen to it, isn't, doesn't really have anything to do with whether or not the specific things Jenny Lewis was singing about actually happened to her. Um, but then it, I, I guess like, I think I, I like for me, at least whenever I've wondered about that, it's always been because the piece that I'm experiencing is resonating with me <clears throat> on a very personal level. And so I feel this connection to the artist and and I, I i i guess what i'm looking for is some further validation of that like saying not just that the art and i have something in common but that the artist and i have something in common but then you know a, as i sort of thought about it more over the years i i was realizing that that is really a way of like it's a very intrusive way of relating to the art and the artist, you know, like it, it's, it's making a presumption, um, that like, like, especially with, with work that's autobiographical or personal or semi autobiographical, it's the artist has already been generous enough to give me that much. Like, why do I need to, Im like, why do I need to take more than that? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's I think, especially, um, you know, oh, just, what were you going to finish there? What was your last point? Oh, just that, like, just that that's especially now that you, we have Twitter and you can actually directly talk to people, <laughs> like, that's <laughs> especially on my mind a lot. Like, what is it that we are yeah. all asking of artists all the time, you know? I think for me, um, it became especially frustrating after spending over a decade writing a novel a heavily researched novel set in Second Empire of France um, about you know, the sort of the everything from the an economy based on the sexual servitude of women to um, the ways in which uh, different kinds of women try to accommodate uh, both what they you know what they wanted for themselves and what the culture expected from them, but then it was just incredibly frustrating to come through all that process, through all that research on opera and opera singers, uh, French history, German history, etc., and then sit down for an interview and have people say, so how much of this is autobiographical? <laughs> 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 and I, I just was like, um, why? <laughs> like, like, why would that matter? Now, yeah, you know, um, but that's 
that was so often the question. That's a and weird question, uh, especially for that book. It is a totally common question. I got so often, usually often first. Um, and I thought, you know, this is, um, this is a way of talking about the novel that is a way of not talking about the novel. Yeah. Like, it becomes this, it turns the, the aesthetic act that you have completed and any uh, political implications of it or social implications or uh, aesthetic implications, and it turns it all into a thing about, like, a, a, a psychological narrative where this thing happened to you and you turn it into a book. Mm. For that. Yeah. yeah. But, and that's, that is just, I mean, I am the least interesting part of a novel about the 19th century. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, I can do it. I can definitely ha- I have that answer now mm-hmm. because people kept asking the question. Yeah. But, um, but it was, it was going. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a certain, um, you know, saying this as a person who's sort of on the other side of the kind of like, I don't really think of these, these podcast episodes as interviews more just as conversations, but I mean, it's, I'm sort of am in that role more now than I uh, have the show. And so I think that there's a certain sort of anxiety that comes with doing an interview when you're interviewing an artist about like, well, what am I going to ask and not sound like an idiot kind of thing? And so sometimes the sort of lowest hanging fruit, it just presents itself. That particular question is not like, I thought a lot about like, what, what would I want to ask Alexander Chi about queen of the night? If, if I got the opportunity to, <laughs> um, and that is not one of the questions that even occurred to me. Um, because it's like, I mean, it's such an epic sweeping, like there's so much going on in that in that book it's such a beautiful um romantic um i already said epic but like there's so so much in it <clears throat> that like why would i ask that question especially because you didn't live in the 19th century <laughs> france and you didn't like i mean i don't know it's just such a weird question you know the ones that i was thinking about would like you know try to avoid a question that he gets all the time like like what made you want to write about an opera singer? Because like, that's also the most obvious possible question. Right. But right, um, but it's, even that is also like, it's making it about, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not so much that I wanted to write about an opera singer. It's like I wanted to, I was hoping to do more than that. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it was, um, but I think again, it's the, uh, you know, thank you, first of all, for understanding, but, like, I think it's, it's just, um, I don't know if they're afraid of um, asking other questions about it or or if they just think this is how you're supposed to do it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's sort of ask that question no matter what. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I To me, I mean, the the... the the question of like the, 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 the sort of the setting and, um, and the opera, the music, like, obviously that's, those are fascinating parts of the book and they're really, um, they're not just like dressing either. Like they're, they're an integral part of the book. And I think that the, uh, I, I, I actually really loved the way that you, um, used the sort of milieu and the, um, and the music, um, in the, in the, the book, I thought the whole, the whole thing was just amazing. It was one of the, uh, I think I read it in, Thank 20, you. I think I read it last summer. Um, and it just really blew me away. The stuff that has stuck with me about it really has to do less with that and more about so much of what I think about when I think about queen of the night has to do with identity rather because I feel like that is a really central theme in the book. Um, obviously with, um, I'm probably, I don't, I never know how to pronounce things, but Liliette or Liliette, how do you, how do you pronounce her name? Well, I joke that even she doesn't know because she stole the name. Right. 
But so anyway, yeah. uh, either is fine. You can say it either way. Yeah. Reset it in your head. I mean, obviously, her identity is something that's central to the book, insofar as she has a stolen identity, and that like her arc has so much to do with who she tries to invent herself as. But I feel like identity uh, is this really central theme throughout the book. And, and like, I, I remember when I was writing it down, there was this passage that had to do with, which she sort of pauses and wonders whose story she's in. Um, mm -hmm. That yeah. was so fascinating to me. And the way that, that, you know, the characters in the book, some of them do or don't have names um, you're not presented with names for all of them. Rather, some of many of them just have. She just describes their role, you know, the tenor or the the countess or, you know, <clears throat> how. I don't know the, the the whole thing. It always just came back to like sort of you know the narrative of a person and 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 of a life and of 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 how we think of ourselves and how others perceive us. That was really what I came back to over and over when I th when I think about this book in in the sort of year plus since I've read it. Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't a question. But... Oh, right. thank you. I appreciate that. I think like one thing that may amuse you to know is that the tenor's name appears exactly once in the book. Mm. It's where he uh, the part of the book where he asks her to take out an ad in the newspaper. And he gives her instructions, and he tells her how to write the ad, and his his name is in the ad hmm. during the siege of Paris. So, you know, if you're curious, <laughs> but <laughs> so it was a fun little game to play. See if anyone noticed. I I think um, I missed that. That I you know, there's uh, the book is so epic, <laughs> so sweeping. Um, which was another thing that I really, um, that I thought a lot about that I feel like so much of literary fiction these days, like I, I, as a reader, when I was a kid, I mostly read science fiction and fantasy where, you know, a big, like sweeping epic story is sort of, you know, the, the, the standard of the genres, but I feel like so much of contemporary literary fiction, which, uh, is, I love now, but I didn't when I was young, um, is tends to be about things that are sort of more mundane experiences, sort of smaller, more interior kind of stories. Um, and this book was just not that at all. Like it's so like so <laughs> big, such a, like, you know, it's like, I don't know. It, it, it reminded me of the kind of thing that would have been like a, an old Hollywood epic romance movie, you know, um, mm -hmm. which just does not seem to be sort of the style right now. And I, and I wondered like, I mean, I guess it seemed like it just must've had to be like some kind of reaction or, 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 or on purpose trying to break away from, from, you know, doing something different, you know, does was what, is that true or, or am I just misreading it? No, I think um, I think you're right. I think uh, it's sort of Ellinger Danis has a quote that is something along the lines of like, "Well, if you could write about angels, why wouldn't you?" You know, mm -hmm. like what he means by that is like push your imagination out as far as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you know? I think there was a period when writing about ordinary lives as a way of truth telling about those lives really mattered. You know, I think it still matters. Um, I think uh, what's problematic, you know, is is like insisting that that's why it's literary. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the, the you know the idea that we had to stay within these boundaries or risk being accused of bad taste is a kind of constant. Mm. I don't know. I'm very interested in bad taste. <laughs> <laughs> taste is such a it's such a loaded thing, you know. It's all it's always something that's it is. It's always yeah. sort of deployed in a I don't know. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, like how taste is sort of deployed as a it's always as a as a criticism. Um it's always something that sort of defends a a, a portion of the status quo. Um I don't know, there's something 
it's not something that I'd ever thought a lot about before, but in the last maybe year or two, um, has really been on my mind a lot. I, I was thinking about, you know, in terms of the, I think one of the things that affected the scope of the novel was actually, uh, reading all of this, uh, all of this manga mm. that I was reading at the time as I was writing it, you know, so I was like, writing The Queen of the Night and reading, you know, Lone Wolf and Cobb and Path of the Assassin and Battling Lolita and, you know, for fun. Um, and and I think, you know, Battling Lolita was one especially that uh, I loved. I just reread it recently because it all, uh, it all came on to Comixology mm. Unlimited. So you can, like, you can borrow it there. And it's, have you read it? It's so fun. I haven't uh, read it. I art. watched the anime when I was a kid, um, but that was a oh, long okay. time ago. So you're familiar with uh, with the character then? Yeah, a bit. It's the, bit. This was probably cyborg. like 25 years ago at this point. But oh, okay. I mean, so for your listeners, the Battle Angel Lolita is about this um, this cyborg who, you know, she's found in a junkyard by this. Uh, by this robot um, scavenger named Dr. Ito, and he falls in love with her sort of beautiful cyborg head that's kind of sitting in uh, suspended animation uh, on this trash heap, you know. So he bring the brain, the brain is still alive inside of the case, um, and so he brings her home and starts building her a body. Uh, you know, out of stolen parts. And he has this idea that he's going to be sort of like the, you know, Pygmalion to her Galatea. And then one night as they're watching this, uh, this <laughs> vampire <laughs> attack them, it's like never explained why there's vampires and that's fine. <laughs> um, uh, the vampire attacks them and she just, leaps into action and at first he's afraid and she absolutely destroys the vampire. Like, we're using what Dr. Ido immediately recognizes as uh, Penzer Kunst, which is a sort of uh, Martian martial arts for, you know, created for cyborg bodies in uh, a gravity that's different from Earth or uh, a low gravity environment. Hmm. And uh, and the more that, which is, I don't know if this is visible in the in the anime, but like in the manga, the the more that she fights, the more that she remembers who she is. And so, fighting for her uh, identity, in a sense, is what she's doing. Mm. She's literally fighting to find out who she is and remember more things. Um, and uh, and that was a fascinating, uh, fascinating. For me, storyline, I just I couldn't get enough of it. I just I have all the books at home. Yeah. I would not have expected that we'd be talking about Battle Angel Alita when I when I <laughs> first <laughs> called you up. But when you uh, brought up the Queen of the Night. Yeah. yeah. So like <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah, that's but that's easily one of the biggest influences on the way I structured the book is like she has all these different identities. She's destroyed and remade again uh, several times. She's always got, she's got this uh, enemy that she can't quite get away from uh, who both, you know, is responsible for her, her greatest strengths and her greatest weaknesses. And, uh, yeah, it's sort of, it ended up being, I would say, I don't know that I knew it at the time. I think it was unconscious, you know, mm -hmm. as, as these processes often are. But that definitely was something I was able to see after, where I thought, oh, you really, that really got in your head. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, so we should probably take a quick break and then come back and do the second segment. So for the for the second segment... Uh, I always ask the guests to bring a topic of their own, which can be just whatever's on your mind, whatever you'd like to talk about. So what would you like to talk about today? Ooh, um, <laughs> I was 
You know, I was talking to a friend of mine about how this weird way we live now, he and I, that is, not maybe it's true of everyone, but just like, you know, I feel like the these things happen on the news and uh, and it's like something takes an eraser and just draws a line through my brain. Mm. You know, like the, the way you like, you might erase part of a drawing by mm-hmm. just erasing through the middle of it. Um, and I just, uh, it's kind of creeping me out. It was sort of like, uh, and I've heard it, I've heard the expression stochastic terror brought up hmm. periodically. It's like way in which, you know, like in one week, you know, Trump will threaten war with North Korea and, you know, say he's going to deport 800,000 dreamers and, you know, nominate, like, only white guys for, uh, you know, the, for the, for the judges that he's trying to get through. And, like, you know, that the CIA is increasingly dominated by white evangelical Christians. Like, that's fucking terrifying. Um, so it's, it's, it, these things happen and I just think, like, when do we, like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to save our, save ourselves if we can? Because it's so, it's so bad. And I, you know, I was turned, listening to the radio this morning and like, it was, I think it was Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me hmm. came on. And, and they, they were doing the kind of patter at the beginning of, the show where they like make a lot of jokes and everybody laughs at them. But the, the joke was like, you know, so, you know, Mitch McConnell, when he calls Donald Trump, you know, uh, has stopped responding when, uh, Trump does chit chat about TV shows such that like, you know, Trump will be like, you yeah, Mitch, you're still there. And he'll, and then he, you know, picks up again, and you know everybody's laughing. You know, it's it's kind of funny. <laughs> it's horrifying, also. Um, <laughs> and uh, because in that, like, in that sort of silence from McConnell is like everything McConnell is putting up with to get everything that McConnell wants out of this president. Yeah, and all that chit chat about TV is like everything that, uh, you know, he's their fool. He's their youthful fool. Um, it's, it's, there's that incredible essay that came out this week from, uh, Tanisi Coates about, you know, the first white president in terms of like, you know, this kind of whiteness, Mm -hmm. um, and it had so many, everybody was tweeting about it earlier this week. It had so many of these, um, incredible quotable lines in it. And I've been thinking about it, uh, for a lot of the week, I guess. Um, because it was, it was one of these things where when I read it, I, I felt like I was experiencing the truth of things. Yeah. You know, like, let's see, here's, Here's a good quote. So he's talking about, like, the way in which, you know, Nicholas Kristof, uh, without, you know, Kristof would probably deny that he's participating in, um, in all of this, but, you know, it, Coates has him dead to rights here, I think, you know, where, like, observing a Trump supporter in the act of deploying racism does not much perturb Kristof. That is because his defenses of the innate goodness of Trump voters and of the innate goodness of the white working class are, in fact, defenses of neither. On the contrary, the white working class functions rhetorically not as a real community of people, so much as a tool to quiet the demands of those who want a more inclusive America. You know? mm-hmm. And this is a, you know, earlier he cites the example of, like, Kristoff interviewing Trump supporters and having one of them say, like, you know, he's so sick of these Obama phones that everybody gets. And, like, this is just one of those, it's like, right with him is. Um, and Kristoff doesn't call him on it. He just sort of allows him to say all this stuff about 
the, those Obama phones, yeah. fucking things up for everybody. Um, and it's a it's a, an examination of this kind of there's so there's the Invisible Empire, which is the Ku Klux Klan, you know, and then there's another Invisible Empire behind it, which is this kind of network of uh, of beliefs that are anchored so firmly in the fabric of the culture and also, like, you know, are so hard to to get people to see and acknowledge and act on, you know. Yeah. (sighs) (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's like, (laughs) how long are we going to do this? Yeah. Like, I, that that Coates piece, which I also, you know, was, it was, you know, I, I mean, I always, like everything he writes, I, I always, um, it's pretty amazing, right? But, um, but yeah. one of the things about that one um, that I thought was the most vital part, right, is that I feel like what he's really talking about is something that I've also been thinking a lot about uh, is how, how, and he's really calling out white people, but I think this actually applies to like much more broadly than that, that, that fundamentally just as I think this is like a human impulse to want to not want to consider our own complicity in, in harm or in oppression, you know, which is something I've been thinking about so much this year. Um, I feel like the most important thing any of us can do, and it's something that I've been spending so much time on, is is to to ask first, well, what, how am I, how am I personally benefiting from this, or how am I personally helping to contribute it to it, or how am I personally at least failing to do anything about it? You know, because I think right. Like I'm not I'm not white, right? But but as an East Asian American, like I have a certain level of privilege um relative to to other ethnic groups. And I know like in my family and other East Asian people I know are often like highly, highly racist against um Latinx people or black people and it's that's something that I have to push against. And then also, you know, like my my wife's family is white, so like who and I like they're all lovely people who I love, but sometimes will be oblivious about these things, you know. And so we've had some had to have some uncomfortable conversations this year, um, and and nobody nobody wants to think of themselves as part of the problem, but I feel like the the unwillingness to consider that that might be the case is really like at the root of, of all of this stuff, you know, this desire to never be emotionally uncomfortable in any way for any amount of time is, is, is it might, might be the greatest source of evil in, in our society, you know? I, I think so. I mean, it's definitely like, it's the same, it's the same with climate change. Yeah, like exactly. People, people fear the sacrifices they'd have to make or so they imagine like if we were to move to a low carbon or car- uh, or no carbon uh, series of power sources, um, mm. but like oil companies have been killing off alternatives to to oil. Like you, all you have to do is look at the history of the electric car, um, you know, for decades. Um, so it, it's sort of you could you could say, well, I'd really be more comfortable if we didn't burn any oil. You know, like that's the comfort that I want to attach to. Yeah. Um, but instead, people people connect to what's convenient. You know. Yeah. Um, I I I sort of I did this thing that uh, it's really I'm sort of I'm, I go back and forth on it I'm, lately, but I'm I'm still pretty I'm still pretty sure it's the right thing for now. Or you know I just I told. Uh, my mo- most of my mother's family, the white side of my family, um, most of them voted for Trump, and I just said, "You'll you'll never see me on purpose again." Um, and uh, like, 
but I'm sticking to it. You know, and I still, I have, I'm still connected to like one of my cousins on Facebook and she will leave, you know, comments sometimes in my photos where she's like, love ya. You know, I'm like, that's look worth nothing to me. <laughs> yeah. I love you too. Like you voted for LePage. Um, and then later complained about how terrible he was. And then when I said, well, didn't you read any of the articles about how terrible he was? You said, I thought that was liberal propaganda. And like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to, indi- how else to indicate to you that like, it's not okay to yeah. do that. Yeah. Like, and I've tried. I've tried. Like people are like, we need to talk to our Trump money relatives. And I'm like, I, I talked to them. I've been talking to them since I was like born, you know, like yeah. we have been having conversations. They have known about like my being, you know, interracial and queer for a very long time, you know, and one of them, you know, when she wrote back to sort of protest what I'd done, uh, she was, she was like, you know, he supports gay rights. And I was like, it's, it's not just about gay rights. Like, this is about everything in my universe, you know, is, is being uh, attacked and, and destroyed, you know. And the people who are like, well, you know, you, you, we dealt with eight years of Obama, you can handle this. And it's like, well, show me the guns that Obama took from you. Yeah. Show me your, show me your empty holsters, you know, like, they don't exist. Like, you... Uh, you didn't lose anything except your ability to get people to do what you wanted when you wanted it um, in a way that was unfair to others. Like you, you got healthcare, you know, that you're now anxious about losing, but you still voted for him, even though you know he'll take it away from you because deep down, what you really want is you just want that unquestioned power that comes from committing the white supremacy. Yeah. So, like, you're not, but, you know, he, Trump, I don't really, what do I know about him and gay people? I know that, like, he held a rainbow flag upside down <laughs> with, like, you know, the gays for Trump on it, and people thought that was, like, great. Um, and uh, I wasn't one of them. But I know that he has staffed his uh, administration with a tremendous number of homophobes of the like highest possible order, including his vice president Pence. Um, and you know, now we're seeing it. We're seeing like the DOJ today go after you know the uh, in support the case of those people who. It's, a, it's that gay bakery case, which yeah. is so uh, possibly consequential. You know, it's like, it's a goddamn case and could destroy my civil rights. <laughs> like, I'm just, you know, like, oh, um, like what the fuck? Um, but yeah, you know, now uh, Sessions is filing briefs in support of the case. So, like, that's that's where we're at today. Um And, you know, last fall, my husband and I, we got married. Uh, Well, we decided to get married in January before Trump took office because of this. And it was because, you know, we we just wanted to have what we had before they would try to take it away. And I know they're going to try to take it away. Yeah. And my husband, Dustin, said... I'd rather have them push me back through the door than bar the door before I could go through it. Um, yeah. So we walk, we walk through the door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's something, you know, I, I, I really feel like it's of limited utility to try and convince people of anything because it, most people, you just, the, the number of people that can be convinced is just vanishingly small. You know, it's something that comes up a lot because I'm, I'm involved a lot with, um, you know, this year I have become involved with the local activist community and, you know, resistance groups. And, um, and that's something that comes up a lot. It's not lost on me that I'm 
one of the few people of color in, in these groups. Um, and they talk a lot about, not all of them, but many of them talk about, you know, the importance of, you know, not getting too radical or, or not, you know, not pushing away Trump voters that, that, that voted for Obama the, before who, you know, maybe we can bring them in kind of thing. And I just keep thinking like, but like, honestly, how many of those people have you talked to that, you, that 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 are having a change of heart like how many of them like we read stories that like i've i've read articles or something that say that oh they're out there you know but i haven't met any of those people i don't know them no, none of them have come to talk to me about it even though you know everybody in my life now that i'm very vocal knows how i feel about these things you know and so if they're thinking that way then 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 why aren't they where are they who are these people you know but we you know i don't know and it's tough too because like especially when it's family, you want to, the the idea that you, that loving someone and having a a history with someone is or ought to be enough to, to, to excuse everything is just, it's like, what is that? What are you supposed to do with that? You know, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like it's just abuse. Yeah. I, I mean, I told my mother, my mother is kind of like family first. She'll say that a lot. And I just was like, look, I'm, it's no longer family first for me. I'm not going to, I just can't do that. I'm yeah. Do yeah. And they're not, obviously they're not thinking family first, right? Like if they're, if people are going to vote in such a way that, you know, could, that, that is taking away your rights and taking away, you know, destroying the planet and, you know, all of these things like, well, they're not, they're not necessarily thinking about these things. You at least are thinking through these things, right? It's. They know how I feel. They, they can see my Facebook posts if yeah. they want to. I, you know, I think, like, um, I'm trying this way now. I'm trying the other way. Yeah. Now I'm trying. You know, like, um, it's, I guess the way that you can approach someone and change their mind about you know, this, that, or the other thing, but, like, you know, I, like, I had, like, when the case of my cousin, the one who voted for the page, and then later complained about it, and later said it was, you know, she, she was unconvinced because she thought that was liberal propaganda that was criticizing him. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. That's like a, she has the fact. Yeah. She always has the fact. I guess the, the way that I put it to her was, I, what I said to her was, you have, you know, you come into uh, my house, you eat with me and my husband, you, you know, drink our drinks. I was like, and you, and you still, even though you know how this man feels now, is like how his party feels about our rights. He still voted for them, and uh, and so I don't, I don't feel like I can show you that hospitality anymore that seems crazy to me yeah you know um uh and so now i am now i am making the point that if you vote that way and you then you don't want that clearly because you voted that way and so you don't get it like and so now all of this goes somewhere else yeah and on some level um, it's like you have to it's not it shouldn't be your responsibility to make these people, these other people, whether regardless of what your relationship with them, it's not your responsibility to make them feel better. Right. And certainly they're not taking any responsibility for your feelings. Um, yeah, it, it's really not. And, and in some ways I feel like, you know, the people who are trying to quote unquote win them back, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know. What, it's like these people who are going to go shoot guns at a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, okay, you're probably going to kill other people and yourself accidentally. Um, uh, but, it, you know, there's just, they think that's going to do something. Yeah. And they don't, they're so separated from the consequences of the situation by white privilege that in some ways I feel like they need to just go run into some consequences. You yeah. Know? Like, what? white privilege doesn't mean the hurricane won't smack you around when you step outside with your gun. Yeah. Like, but go ahead, try it out. Like, see that word. 
Oh man! But that's really what they put their bets on. They, they, you know, it's like they've decided that that. Anyway, we'll see. <laughs> I guess we'll see. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe shooting the hurricane will do something. It would be but, nice to be uh, wrong, right? I, I would love it. <laughs> I uh, would love it. Yeah. So, um, I really appreciate you get taking the time and talking with you. There's one last question that I always ask everyone. And, okay. and that is if there is a, if there is a piece of, of art or literature or just general creativity that you've experienced recently, that meant something to you. Um, yeah, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading Dennis Johnson collection of nonfiction called Eek hmm. right now. And it's such a huge pleasure you know, I haven't, I hadn't actually really read more than his fiction, weirdly. I don't know why. And uh, this is a collection of his travel writing and reporting and personal essays. And, um, and I just, I love it. It's really phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, a great way to, he was my teacher at Iowa, and it's a great way to feel like I'm able to, able to be in conversation with him even though he's gone yeah um, so. all right well great thanks so much um i really appreciated sure. talking with you likewise Okay, so you heard us talk about The Queen of the Night, and I put a link in the show notes for that where you can buy it. Um, Alexander's first novel, Edinburgh, was re-released last year, that's 2016, in a wonderful new paperback edition, and there is a link in the show notes for that as well. And do make sure to look out for his essay collection when it comes out in April. That's called How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. Now, the giveaway. Just like last time, if you want to enter the drawing to win a free paperback copy of The Queen of the Night, here's what you do. Subscribe to the KTCO newsletter by going to keepthechannelopen.com slash connect and filling out the form there. There's also a link in the show notes for that. Don't forget to confirm your subscription when you get your confirmation email. And then just send me a quick note at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com and let me know you're entering the drawing. And that's it. And if you're already subscribed to the newsletter, you don't even have to do that step. You're already done with that. Just let me know you want to enter and you're good. I'll be announcing the results next week on Wednesday, October 18th, that's 2017, at 1 p.m. Pacific Time. And that is our show. If you'd like to support what we do here, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps boost the show's rankings and helps new listeners find the show. Uh, You can find a link in the show notes for that. If you'd really like to go above and beyond, you can also make a monthly pledge to our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash sake river. That's patreon.com slash sake river sake like the drink and river like river and your donations in any amount are greatly appreciated and they help me be able to do stuff like the giveaway i just mentioned you can follow me and the show on twitter at channel open pod or on facebook at facebook.com slash keep the channel open our theme music is by poddington bear you can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com next time our guest will be science fiction and fantasy writer mari ness so be sure to come back for that Until then, remember, keep the channel open. (laughs) 